Normally here on Mellow Gaming Recommends, I like to give a rundown of a game that at some point in my life has brought me quite a lot of joy, even if that game is objectively maybe a little bit average. Today we're going to be looking at multiple games by one developer, a developer who has consistently managed to create games that brought me, personally, a lot of joy. That developer is Terry Kavanagh, and what we're going to do today is take a look at some of the smaller games, and then a bit more of an in-depth look at a couple of my personal favourites. Terry Kavanagh has been releasing games through various avenues since 2008, with his first game being Soldiers, a retro-styled army-based arcade shooter. One of his earliest games, Don't Look Back, was an Atari VCS-style take on the Greek legend of Orpheus and Eurydike, which Terry has described as a silly shooter, and was initially blocked from release on iOS because its marketing material included the phrase, there's no in-app purchases or any of that nonsense. A year later, after Don't Look Back, Terry released a game called VVVVVV, but in a style similar to that of Slope's Game Room, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. We'll be looking at that game a little later in the video. I'm not going to cover all his games here because, well, Terry has been a very busy boy. Also, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce this one. Baba Dalgalagahad Attack Karamunaran Ronkad Con Bront Onton Ronchunt Hunt Hunt A Front Hunt Kavar Hounds Osh De Kas A Two Hu Hu Den Hunt Funnanaruk which is apparently a word which means the symbolic thunderclap associated with the fall of Adam and Eve. Created by James Joyce, apparently. What the hell, man? You couldn't have said boom? In 2013, Terry released an isometric adventure platformer in the style of games such as Solstice and Head Over Hills, called Naya's Quest. In it, your perceptions of perspective are put to the test as you attempt to navigate some rather confusingly laid out rooms using a device that reveals the true path. It's a tricky game that can really bend your mind grape from time to time in a way games like Fez and The Witness do that feels very satisfying to me. Well worth a go. A game that I only recently got playing was Grab Them By The Eyes, a game where you play a burger van owning man who's been challenged by an upstart rival to sell more burgers than them in a week to claim ownership of the street corner. Only trouble is, they have a very nice sign. You advance through a week of burger selling, aiming to grab as many customers by the eyes as possible by purchasing and designing more and more elaborate signage for your van. You can pick flashing lights of various colours, all kinds of grandiose patterns, and even type in what words you want the sign to display. The game only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to play through one, so something you can give a try in less time than it takes to watch the rest of this video. Please do watch the rest of this video though. I may have sabotaged myself there. A smaller game of Terry's I've spent a silly amount of time getting slightly less terrible at is Maverick Bird, a game that takes the concept of Flappy Bird and makes it techno as feck. Pumping music, psychedelic colours, simple controls and a crazy infuriating difficulty curve all come together to create a game that you can sit anyone down in front of and they'll understand it instantly and also want to kill you. I've never gotten very far through Maverick Bird's tunnel of flashing death but I surely did keep hitting restart over and over again. Now I wanted to focus in on a couple of games, and the first one we're going to look at is a game that manages to hit a similar sweet spot between frustration and pure fun as Maverick Bird does, and that is 2012's Super Hexagon. Super Hexagon is a simple concept. You control a small triangle, this small triangle, and move it left to right, avoiding the incoming walls on a rotating hexagon. Pretty simple, right? Well, yes, it is, if you happen to be Daryl. Not sure how much of my audience will get that reference. Comment in the description if you got that reference. Anyway, this game moves at 100 miles an hour and only gets faster. Average play sessions can be a couple of seconds long to, well, not much longer than that. There's no easy mode either. The easiest difficulty is called hard, and it is that. There's six difficulties in total and I still can't unlock them all. All you have to do to unlock them is survive for a minute in the lower difficulties. I do not have the dexterity for those, and only robots do. It doesn't stop me playing though, this game makes for an amazing quick palate cleanser. I like to chuck it on and have a quick blast of pure gameplay fun when I'm tired of other games, and I usually rage quit within minutes. And then a few days later, I'll be playing it again. There's a minimalism to the gameplay design which is literally boiled down to move into avoid walls, something you've been doing in games since those old LCD racing games in the 80s, which comes together to create a pure and addictive experience. 
What really helps drive the experience along is the amazing chiptune music by Neve Houston, who's commonly known as Chipsel. The tunes are like a musical embodiment of concentration and there's no way I could imagine the game without them. Brilliantly, the tunes actually play for about 3 minutes apiece but you'll probably never hear the whole thing because you'll be restarting so often. Although it does restart the tunes at different points, Terry clearly didn't want 75% of Chipsall's work to go unheard. Controls are tight to a degree that they can translate from one device to another pretty well. The iOS version just involves simple taps on the left and right sides of the screen which is super intuitive. On PC you can use the arrow keys, left and right mouse button or, as I do, the LB and RB bumpers of my Xbox pad. Find the control scheme that works for you and just go for it. You'll need some crazy focus to get anywhere on the harder stages though, focus I do not have. But I'll still play another round anyway. One thing I love about Terry's game is that he takes a gameplay mechanic or idea and stretches it to its fullest. The games never outstay their welcome, for example Super Hexagon is an arcadey Twitch game that lasts a few minutes at a time, whereas Naya's Quest is a little bit more of a longer drawn out affair. Now when he finds a gameplay mechanic that literally turns the genre on its head, he can fully explore that and make something a lot bigger, and that's exactly what he did with the game V. V V V V, which I genuinely have no idea how to correctly pronounce, is a retro themed platformer with one simple mechanic that gets extrapolated to its extreme. That mechanic is, basically, you have no jump and instead flip the world's gravity in order to raise your character, Captain Viridian, up to the ceiling or back down to the ground. At first this is all pretty simple. You can flip the gravity to reach the ceiling to avoid some spikes and then drop back down to hit the checkpoint, and then you mix that in with avoiding enemies, landing or moving or collapsing platforms, barriers that flip the gravity for you and so on which gradually adds to the game's complexity. The game is presented a lot like a Metroidvania style game in that you have a huge open environment to explore, with the goal being to retrieve your crew members who have been spread about this world by a calamity of quantum proportions. You can approach any area you like in any order you like, as there's no power ups used to unlock locations. This game purely relies on your gravity flipping skill to progress. Each area tends to have a theme to its puzzles and the only collectibles are disc like trinkets that are placed in challenge rooms. Collecting them lets you change the music in your spaceship base. Some of these challenges are tricky, some of them are a real challenge. And then there's Veni Vidi Vici, doing things the hard way, which no, I cannot do. All you have to do is reach this disc that's placed behind this wall. In any other game, you could just jump the tiny wall. In six Vs in a row, you must flip gravity, ride up six screens of spikes, land on a collapsing platform, and fall back through those six screens again, making sure you land on the right side of the tiny block to collect the disc. If you want to see how frustrating this challenge really is, then check out episode 8 of Game Grump's Steam Train playthrough of the game. It gets emotional. It's really hard. <laughs> Dinkles, what have you created? No! Ah! 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 Oh my god! Oh, okay. The game's challenge comes from both pure character navigational skills where the game requires you to perform near pixel perfect motions to proceed and some puzzle solving as you figure out what the environment is doing and how to use that to make it through the room. From time to time you'll rescue a member of your crew and at one point you'll be tasked with moving the crew member through a series of rooms where they only move forward while Captain Viridian is on the ground. This gets very complicated and requires you to have an extra level of spatial awareness as you attempt to essentially control two characters at once. This sequence takes place in a part of the map you will not enter again and is intended to be a little hurdle to jump before you make any more progress. It's tough, but doable. And then there's the other hurdles. Later in the game, when you've rescued nearly all the crew members, you're whisked away to the Gravitron. Here you must survive for a minute being bounced up and down with no control over the gravity for yourself, whilst avoiding incoming obstacles. The game gives you a little bit of help by providing soft checkpoints when you pass certain points in the countdown but that doesn't stop this being an infamously tricky stage. You've got to find the right rhythm and get real good at judging where your path will cross with those of the enemies, and this isn't even, in my opinion, the hardest mandatory part of the game. After you rescue the final crew member, you're taken to the final stage, where you'll be tested to the fullest. This part of the game is probably responsible for a third of the deaths I had during my playthrough while recording this. I find it that tricky. And that's why I love it. 
The letter V six times is challenging in that perfect way where you never feel like the game is being unfair. Even in the Veni Vidi Vici room, you are shown the path beforehand. You know that this split in the path on the way back is a trap. You have all the knowledge you need to succeed. You'll get frustrated and angry and maybe even kill a guy, but hey, that's just video games. The whole time you'll be able to see what you need to do and it's entirely your fault if you can't do it. This has to be one of the purest skill based challenges in gaming. As you can probably tell from looking at it, V has an art style that hits a specific point of nostalgia for myself, and I imagine for many gamers my age. The look of the game is modelled on the look of computers such as the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC. Light on colour palette, chunky on the sprites and visually a little bit mad. Terry says the enemies were all just inspired by dreams he had, but there's certainly some influence from the sort of random enemies you'd see in their games of the 80s, such as Jet Set Willy. The central gameplay mechanic of V is influenced by a game called Terminus from the days of the ZX Spectrum, where a character called Magno had the ability to flip gravity at will, just like Captain Viridian. Topping off the retro feel is music by Swedish composer Magnus Solai Palsen, whose upbeat chiptune style gives the game a feeling of fun but also triggers that feeling of focus required of games like this. The music is often fast paced and is constantly commanding you to drive forward. I feel as if the fact that it's fun and uplifting to listen to is part of the reason why the game never becomes too frustrating. It also helps that it's just great to stop and listen to. Since VVVVV, Terry has released many games, including some we've covered here. His most recent release was Tiny Heist, a roguelike stealth game where you move through maze-like rooms avoiding guards, dogs and cameras, like you would in any stealth game. The difference here is that your enemies only move when you do. You have to plan your steps ahead to avoid being seen while you attempt to claim any treasure in the rooms. You can knock out guards and cameras along the way and pick up items to aid you in your task. It's a fun game and free to play like many of Terry's games on his website distractionware.com. So that's our brief look at the games of Terry Kavanagh. Now he's not just made games, he's also made a beginner's music making tool called Bosca CO, a chatbot program called Eliza Script, and even a level editor for V. I'm not sure what games he's making next, he's got one in the works that you can see previews of on his website Distractionware, but whatever it is I'm sure it's going to be quirky and fun and probably have really tight gameplay mechanics and controls. Whatever it is I can't wait to play it, maybe even play it on Mellow Gaming. But thanks for watching guys, thanks for getting this far through the video, really appreciate it, and I'll catch you later, bye. Thanks once again for watching guys, it's uh, much appreciated, oh crap you only get 20 seconds on these new end slates don't you? Um, tell me what episode you'd like to see next from Mellow Gaming Recommends, um, I'm thinking either a retro game that I've got in mind or an obscure Steam game which you know not many people have played. So you know, tell me in the comments below which one you'd like and oh god I'm running out of time already, 